coming up on Chopper's Brexit podcast. It was the night before Christmas when all through the house not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. Hello and welcome to Chopper's Brexit podcast. I'm Christopher Hope, the Telegraph's chief political correspondent, speaking to you on the morning of the Queen's speech from the Red Lion pub just across from the Houses of Parliament. 2019, what a year it's been. We've had three Brexit extensions, 67 episodes and only one cancellation by Boris Johnson on the night before we're about to broadcast. Thank you for that, Prime Minister. We'll forgive you for most things, but not that yet. Today I'm joined by David Jones, a former Tory Brexit minister, who'll tell me whether he can relax finally about Brexit over the Christmas break. Plus I'm joined by Daisy Cooper, a brand new Liberal Democrat MP who's vying for the party leadership just days into starting her job in Parliament. But first up, I'm pleased to be joined by Geoffrey Cox, the Attorney General and MP for Torridge and West Devon, who won his seat last week for the fifth time in a row, receiving nearly 60% of the vote. He's also the MP with the best voice in Westminster, and we'll be putting that to great use later on with a small Christmas surprise just for you, dear listener. But more on that later. Geoffrey, welcome to Chopper's Brexit podcast. It's a pleasure to be here, it's Chris. great to have you on, and you've brought along some readings later, which I'm terribly excited about hearing you read. Can leave us relax now? Is Brexit going to happen? The government will carry out its promises. Simple as that. We'll be leaving on the 31st of January. I was watching that Laura Koonsberg documentary, which is the second of many instalments about Brexit, I imagine, and it was like a different world, you know, even until about, I mean, like a dream, the period last year when we were obsessing about what Anna Soubry felt about Brexit or or people who were upset and wanted to frustrate the process. And now it's all just gone, like a wave crashed on a beach or something. That's the effect of a majority in Westminster. I mean, the whole system is 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 uh, emasculated if you don't have a majority. Prime Minister has got a great majority. He won a fantastic and resounding victory, and that will bring order and and decisiveness to what was previously yes. chaos and paralysis. And in contested parliaments, your legal advice becomes very important, as it did in uh, your predecessor during the Iraq war, and it did last year, didn't it? And your words are poured over, and the pressure on you is quite a lot, I imagine. Last April, for example, when you're pulling out your view, you were very brave, you on Theresa May's deal. Well, it's never uh, pleasant for a lawyer to have his advice, which is intended to be confidential and aimed at a particular audience, pulled from him like a tooth. Um, <laughs> so I'm hoping that on this occasion there'll be fewer humble addresses. Mm. And lawyers hate also giving clients bad news, and that's what you had to give Theresa May last year. Well, you have it? to give honest news. You have to tell it as it is. Mm. There's no point as a lawyer painting rosy castles in the air because at the first breath of reality they shatter. Mm. So you have to tell the truth, which is what I I tried to do. Well, it was quite a moment last April when your your advice was published. You've been up all night doing it, I think, from memory, hadn't I you? Had, yeah. I mean, the pressure on you was huge then. Well, I mean, I had told the Prime Minister mm. previously that that, uh, that was uh, going to be what I had to say. I mean, it wasn't as if uh, previously the position hadn't been well known because we'd known what was under negotiation. And um, so it, it, it wouldn't have come as a surprise, but uh, at least I hope it wouldn't. But no, I mean, I, I had to write what were the facts, and the facts were that uh, there had been no sub- significant change in the crucial The backstop facts. issue. Yeah. And the New Deal that is more of a front stop than a backstop allows Britain to diverge if it wants to or not want to. It's up to, up to and it feels both sides have given more than previously. Well, I think there's no question that, that there were a significant movement uh, created by the Prime Minister um, in the EU's position. Uh, I think the Prime Minister has negotiated a deal that is flexible enough to ensure that there is no material divergence between Northern Ireland and the rest of the United Kingdom. But a great deal will will reside in the detail and negotiations Mm. to come. And it can be done by the end of this year? I mean, or end of 2020, I should say. I I think it can be with goodwill. I really do. I mean, the Prime Minister succeeded in three months in doing what what, uh, I think most people felt, including me, was Mm. probably impossible. Mm. Um, With will, with verve, with drive, and with precision in, uh, in our objectives, I think we can achieve it. Without threatening a no deal? Because that's what got him into a really good position in, in October. 
Well, I think the consequences um, of not reaching an agreement is that you have no agreement. Mm. So the threat's always there. Well, I don't think it's a threat. I mean, it's I think I mean, it's no more a threat than, um, than than any bargain that's made. I mean, if you don't reach a bargain, there is no bargain. Mm. Look, I don't think we want to dwell on that aspect of it because I'm very confident mm. that with goodwill on both sides, we can succeed in getting a very good deal. And you can start being an AG again. It would be nice, <laughs> Chris, yes. I, mean, I, I, I enjoy and, and regard the job as a huge honour and privilege. So... That the aspects of attending again to the criminal justice system, to um, supervising and superintending mm. the prosecutions in this country and, and, and dealing with the things that the AG traditionally does. Yeah. And, of course, we have an interesting constitutional change mm. program that we have to uh, flesh out and work through. And uh, all of those things will be great challenges and hugely important to the country. Of course, three quarters of your work is below the line. You're dealing with criminal cases you can't discuss now mm. at all in public. There's some policy level in there, isn't there? What's in your policy tray for this year? Well, I've got uh, some quite critical questions that arise in the criminal justice system, which uh, with the Secretary of State for Justice, with the Home Secretary, we're going to be renewing and, and, and adding with added vigour coming to things like the problems we've had with disclosure in the criminal justice mm. system, which I'm working on at the moment, uh, about to issue new Attorney General's guidelines. There is the critical question, of course, of prosecutions for rape, which... Um, Why are they so low? What's, what? Well, I mean, it's, it's historically low. I mean, it's not, not, a, not a new thing, but it's appalling. Uh, uh, that is a very good question, and it's one the government's currently reviewing. Uh, we've just had a... Uh, uh, inspectorate report, CPS inspectorate report, which has shown that there's no sign that the uh, prosecution service is not charging where charges are appropriate. So I think we have to look elsewhere, and those are urgent priorities which the government is going to attend to. I mean, we're starting today. I mean, it's uh, it's a matter after the election. We're restarting, and uh, matter that really does require urgent attention. So if you look elsewhere, will it be the Sentencing Guidelines Council, the Law Commission might look at it? Well, what's the plan? Well, I think the Law Commission is is a long-range thing. I mean, as you know, in our manifesto, we have a Royal Commission, which we're uh, going to set up to examine how we streamline and how we make more efficient and maintain the great attributes and virtues of the criminal justice system in this country, but improve it and make it uh, even better. And I think I think the... But I think on this question, we really have to act more quickly than a Royal Commission timeline requires, and that's our intention. And how, what will you do? If you, can you well, look, I, think, I think it's too early to say, Chris. I mean, I think, I think you know, the, the one thing one doesn't want to do is automatic responses straight away. I think we need to examine the evidence and over a short timeline take... Uh, steps because so, we're letting down victims aren't we, we? are I mean, it's not we as a country we, we are it's not acceptable we have to uh, pick up on what has gone wrong and mm. um, but as I say at the moment I think there will be a, 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 a really quite uh, intense focus on this the Prime Minister himself is engaged on it um, we are having a um, new trilateral committee of the three ministers, myself included, responsible for the criminal justice system, and the Prime Minister will is likely to attend mm. some or all of those meetings. And so we are, we really are going to get to grips with it. I think it needs it. And as you say, it's, um, it's something that we need to remedy quickly. So it's back to normal. In the sense um, of dealing with actual no, events, on, I don't think after a, with B. after a general election victory like that, nothing is back to normal. No. We, we can't go back to normal. We have to concentrate on doing our job, which is fulfilling the pledges and promises we've made of genuine change yeah. to people's lives. How did you find the campaign? You're wearing a scarf. You didn't get ill, did you? A lot of people <laughs> like, I was got worn uh, down by the cold. It, 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 it was a winter campaign. As I say, what, it was very odd because because it gets dark at four thirty. Mm. And although in a town it's quite possible to knock on people's doors because you've got street lighting, if I'm wandering down a dark yeah. village, uh, 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 village st street or lane, it's, it's never all that convenient to knock yeah. on a door. So it was, was unusual. A lot yes. more was done by social media. Yes. Uh, we started earlier. We finished earlier. But look, I mean, the campaign was invigorating because every politician likes to go back to the people and mm. see what they're thinking and, and saying. Be reminded what they think. Yeah, and on this occasion, what we heard was good. <laughs> it's not always <laughs> not the always case. good for any no, party. Not always the case. I mean, what extraordinary! I mean, and, and all the the you know, 
again, I was watching this Laura Kunzberg documentary and telling us about all the events of the past year. It's like almost like a dream uh, how stuck this place felt. And now it feels like it's just been, well, the Dino Rod election, as uh, Boris Johnson was one of his metaphors, and that's mm. the works. It feels like it's been cleansed colonically irrigated doesn't it I agree I mean I the, the, the as you know I mean quite famously I'm afraid I castigated our parliament probably shouldn't have lost my I thought it was terrific well um I thought it was terrific it, it, it divided opinion um yes. but not, not much telegraphy um, uh, well but but the point is that that it was a pent-up frustration with a parliament that simply would not work it mm. would not implement what British people required it, despite both major parties committing to it, they would not find a means. And so I, the, I felt the only solution was an election, and yet even that, <laughs> three times, they, it was not they, bad. they would uh, prevent and resist. Mm. So I think, I, mean, I have to be honest, I think that played a significant part in the reaction of the election. How soon will a fixed term parliament act be repealed? <laughs> I, I hope in the first 12 months, but that's a matter for the Prime <laughs> of Minister. Of course it is. I just, uh, the, and that's why it was a six-month, six, month, six week campaign it would have been three weeks like in october 74 but it was right. longer than normal because of the requirements in, in that piece of legislation exactly so and and i think it's been shown to be um a, a, frankly a damaging yes. and and ill in ill-judged reform it should have been only for that particular government i can only say with a degree of immodesty and self-righteousness that i did vote against it <laughs> It just doesn't fit the British Constitution. There is due a review of it in 2020. If, if the actual small print requires a review of that legislation, mm. in, so I, you know that review might begin bring down the curtain on that period. Do you lose, lose any friends over Brexit? Uh, I don't. I'd, I hope not. Um, I know, of course, as we all do, people who differ in in opinions. But I try. Um, to remain civil, and not just civil, but to try to understand and empathise with the view of others on this question. And I've said before to those who've interviewed me that I understand why people feel so deeply about it and feel deeply disorientated and disconcerted, because this is a matter that goes to identity. One, one view, well, on one side, the conception, well, the conception of sovereignty, the conception of a sovereign state, but on the other, over 45 years, an alteration of British identity, a new layer of identity, which many people embraced, which was of a pan-European um, a, a identity, a pan-European um, um, sense of, of self. And if you remove that, then you're removing something quite deep. Now, all I would say to those people is we're not going to remove it. We'll have a new relationship with Europe, with the EU, a close relationship. Uh, it will be different, but it will not be gone. But one that respects our heritage, maybe. Well, the, I, the, the, If you know what I mean, the history of this country going back hundreds of years. I mean, I, I've always taken the view um, that... The jo our joining of the EU was a mistake. I think it was a misconception of the historical truths about the nature of our country. Um, I understand it was taken in sincere and, and well-motivated uh, reasons, but I think it was a mistake, and I think the country has corrected that. But that leaves us with a lot of work to do. We have to build a positive creative relationship with our European neighbours and that I'm convinced we can do and in their wisdom the British people have now given us the means to do it because they've given us a majority which will enable clear leadership and decisive direction. Now listen, thank you so much for talking to us for a good 11, 12 minutes. I wanted listeners to get used to your mellifluous tones because I've been a, such a fan of your voice ever since you did a reading on, on a rival podcast with Nick Robinson. On good Twitter, time. people think there's a future for you in audio books when right. you've finished being... Yes. What do you, what, have you been approached? Yet? Your, your son my, is involved my, in audio My son does make audio books, yes, and I, I'm... Um um, uh, but I've tried to stay out of it for the moment because, you know, I've got another job. Yes, Chris, yeah. well, I've often time. criticised for taking more than one job. So yes. I, 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 I'm, I'm fully focused on being right. Attorney General. But you'd like me to read this one? I've given you a, a you haven't seen it before, so mm. we'll forgive you if you have to pause. But it's Twas the Night Before Christmas, which is a terrific read, and it's entirely seasonal when you're ready. OK. Mm. Over to you, Geoffrey Cox. Twas the Night Before Christmas by Clement Danes. It was the night before Christmas when all through the house 
Not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care in hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. The children were nestled all snug in their beds while visions of sugar plums danced in their heads and Mamma in her kerchief and I in my cap had just settled our brains for a long winter's nap when out on the lawn there arose such a clatter I sprang from the bed to see what was the matter. Away to the window I flew like a flash, tore open the shutters and threw up the sash. The moon on the breast of the new-fallen snow gave the luster of midday to objects below. When what to my wondering eyes should appear but a miniature sleigh and eight tiny reindeer. With a little old driver so lively and quick, I knew in a moment it must be St. Nick. More rapid than eagles, his courses they came, and he whistled and shouted and called them by name. Now Dasher, now Dancer, now Prancer and Vixen, on Comet, on Cupid, on Donder and Blitzen, to the top of the porch, to the top of the wall. Now dash away, dash away, dash away all. As dry leaves that before the wild hurricane fly, when they meet with an obstacle, mount to the sky. So up to the housetop the coursers they flew, with the sleigh full of toys, and St. Nicholas too. And then, in a twinkling, I heard on the roof the prancing and pawing of each little hoof. As I drew in my head and was turning around, down the chimney St. Nicholas came with a bound. He was dressed all in fur, from his head to his foot, but his clothes were all tarnished with ashes and soot. A bundle of toys he had flung on his back, and he looked like a peddler just opening his sack. His eyes, how they twinkled, his dimples, how merry, his cheeks were like roses, his nose like a cherry, his droll little mouth was drawn up like a bow, and the beard of his chin was as white as the snow. The stump of a pipe he held tight in his teeth, and the smoke it encircled his head like a wreath. He had a broad face and a little round belly that shook when he laughed like a bowl full of jelly. He was chubby and plump, a right jolly old elf, and I laughed when I saw him in spite of myself. A wink of his eye and a twist of his head soon gave me to know I had nothing to dread. He spoke not a word but went straight to his work, and filled all the stockings, then turned with a jerk, and laying his finger aside of his nose, and giving a nod, up the chimney he rose. He sprang to his sleigh, to his team gave a whistle, and away they all flew, like the down of a thistle. But I heard him exclaim, ere he drove out of sight, Happy Christmas to all, and to all, a good night. All right. Very good. <laughs> Jeffrey Cox, happy Christmas, and thank you for coming and on the Happy Brexit Christmas podcast. to you and to all your listeners. Chris. Thank you, Jeff. Right, stay with us. In just a moment, I'll be joined by someone who could be the next leader of the Liberal Democrat Party right after this. Hi, I'm Claire Newell. When I tell people I'm the Telegraph's investigations editor, they sometimes ask me if it means I'm a spy and have lots of disguises. And there is a bit of blending into the background, but generally I spend lots of time working with sources, piecing together evidence to reveal wrongdoing and hold the powerful to account. Our stories question, scrutinise and inform. But we can't do that without the support of our subscribers. Their contribution allows us to dedicate time to stories such as our investigation into the allegations that Sir Philip Green had sexually and racially harassed staff. So if you'd like to support what we're doing and get unlimited access to the huge range of quality journalism on politics, sport, business, culture and more, head to telegraph.co.uk forward slash chopper, where you can get 30 days free access to the Telegraph online. And after that, it's just £2 a week. My next guest has been an MP for barely a week, but she has grand ambitions. Daisy Cooper is St Albans' first ever Lib Dem MP. 
and there are rumours she has eyes on the top job. Daisy, welcome to Chopper's Brexit podcast. Thank you very much. You're fresh in, you know, crumbs. You've, you, this time last week, you, you know, you weren't, you weren't an MP, were you? It's Thursday morning, so you weren't. Um, That's what, right. What an extraordinary success. Congratulations. Thank you very much. How's it been? Uh, frenetic. It's been really, really busy. Um, I went into uh, the count in the early hours of Friday morning with just six unread emails across my various inboxes, and I've got more than a thousand. I've had more mm. than a thousand just in the first. Are they week. all lobbyists? Uh, not all lobbyists. <laughs> no, there's been a combination of lobbyists, uh, parliamentary estate notifications, uh, messages from the whips office, which you definitely can't ignore, and uh, obviously hundreds of emails from um, mm. from constituents, from local people as well, looking for help on various issues. Good. And have you been promised a front bench role yet? There's only twelve of you, so uh, you got a chance. <laughs> No, we've had some initial discussions about what portfolios we're interested in, but I imagine we'll get that sorted out over the Christmas and New Year period. So it's quite a small team of the Lib Dems. There's 12 of you. I mean, you can fit in a minibus. Have you been promised a front bench job yet? Um, we'll be sorting out the portfolios over the Christmas and New Year period, I think. Mm. And uh, there's also a, there's a leadership vacancy because poor old Jo Swinson lost her role, didn't she, last week? You might stand, which is very interesting. And why not? You've got five years to prove your mettle and get known. You've got a good chance. Well, the first thing's first. Um, I've got a constituency office to set up. Of I've got my first surgery on Saturday morning. We've got a big drive for the local food bank. Um, and uh, Ed will do a great job as our, you know, as our interim leader. Ed Davey, um, that's Ed is. Davey, that's right. And uh, obviously we've got a lot to look at. You know, we've got the Queen's speech today. Uh, there's been some sort of pre-releases of what might be in it. Uh, obviously there's going to be a huge job in January with the Conservatives pushing forward the withdrawal agreement and all the related legislation. So that for us is a priority, scrutinising the Conservatives every step of the way. So yes, yes. There is a leadership uh, vacancy, um, and I think we'll have to look at the best time to hold that uh, that, that competition. Uh, and if I think the timing's right for me, I may well go for it. But I certainly, at this stage, haven't. It's not my number one priority, but I certainly not. haven't ruled it out. And there's, and there's Christmas first, of course, to so have a break with your family. Yes. But would it be yeah. spring? When would the leadership campaign be? Um, so that's a decision for our federal board and I know some discussions are happening at the moment about the best time to have it. It will obviously be next year sometime but we're not quite sure yet what the what the timeline's looking like. It could be some second quarter next year if we pushed out. That's right. It could, it could be in the second quarter. It could be after spring. It could be yeah. perhaps even after the local elections. Who knows? Yeah. Um, but certainly sometime next year. You're a Remainer, aren't you? I am a Remainer through and through. Were you comfortable with this revoke policy which the party agreed in September? Uh, my, my opinion of it was it was a good idea in September. It dealt with the political crisis then. It looked a bit silly by November because we're living in such febrile times. Yeah, well, I think once the decision had been made that Joe was going to be positioned, as Joe Swinson was positioned as a candidate for Prime Minister, I think the revoke position was the only position we could have run with. Otherwise, we might, might have ended up in the situation that the Labour Party were in, where you know we could have been asked, well, you're the party of Remain, but which deal are you going to put to the people's yes. vote? You know, Theresa May's deal or Johnson's deal or your own Lib Dem deal. So it wouldn't have made sense doing anything else. I think had we perhaps have sort of said, well, we think we can be a break on the other two parties in you know, one shape or another. Which is true. Uh, Which yes. Is, that's the truth of it, isn't then, it? Then we perhaps could have stuck to our, our people's vote line. Mm. So I think yeah, there's, there's a wash-up needs to be done, a period of reflection about mm. how that policy went down. I know, for example, in St Albans, that there was a very mixed reaction. Actually, a lot of people really liked the policy. They were just very quiet in saying so and didn't want to come out publicly and say, this is a great idea. So secretly, a lot of people really liked the policy. But of mm. course, I recognise there are some people who found it quite a bold move um, and um, and found it quite surprising. But ultimately, our priority throughout has been to say that we were Remainers. You know, we stood on a platform of stopping Brexit. I don't think we have any regrets about that. I think for us, there was a secondary consideration really about how we did it. The, the con- I think the concern I found meeting voters in the campaign was that you were Liberal Democrats, but you wanted to stop a democratic decision that took place in, in 2016. I mean, what made sense to me was the, the second referendum on the deal. Yeah. But then the the revoke policy was if you became a majority party in Parliament, then you'd revoke. That was the point, wasn't it? It was. And I think it was a two-stage policy that made little sense to people, a lot of people. Yeah, I think it was quite complicated to explain, and I accept that. We would only be in a position to stop Brexit if we had had a democratic mandate to do so. And we were quite clear about that. So if we had a democratic mandate through a general election, then we would have revoked. If we had a democratic mandate through a vote of parliament, we would have stuck with a people's vote. But on the doorstep, that is quite a complicated policy to explain. And we're going to have to sort of reflect on whether it was the right move or whether it was communicated properly and whether we could have done things in a different way. Did it cost you votes? I mean, you only won one seat as a party, your seat, and made no no ground. Dominic Raab was one target, for example, in Isha and Walton. That didn't come off. Did it cost you votes? Uh, well, ultimately, as you say, you know, we um, only got uh, you know a small number of us elected. Well, you won billions of votes, though, didn't you? We did. I mean, millions uh, of votes. Yeah. 
our vote share went up in this election, but we ended up with fewer seats. And that's really frustrating for us. As you know, we're long-term uh, supporters of proportional representation. I can see why. And You'd end up reform. with um, 60 seats for those kind of numbers, wouldn't you? Precisely. But I think, you know, we will have to have a period of wash-up to see why we didn't make the gains that we did. It, it could have been a whole range of different issues, whether it was in terms of positioning, whether it was around Article 50, or whether it was more sort of tactical in terms of where we put our resources. But we'll have to do that wash-up like we do after every single election. Yeah. Well, will the Lib Dems have long to wait before getting more support, you think? And Brexit could be a, it could be an opportunity because the point about Brexit is it's meant to give power back to people like you, MPs, rather than offering you know, power over to Brussels bureaucrats. There's a chance if you embrace Brexit as a party, it may actually help you with your uh, goals. <laughs> well, we're not going to be embracing Brexit, I can tell you that for sure. I mean, our values haven't changed. You know, yeah. and we are an open, internationalist, uh, environmentalist, pro-business, pro-social justice kind of party. That's Our values what the Tories will... say. They say they're open to deals, they're open to the world, there's a chance to break free from the shackles of the EU. That's what they say. Well, that's just liberal window dressing, I think. I mean, what's clear is I think the Conservatives are pursuing an agenda that is making us withdraw from the world, um, you know, looking at maybe protectionist measures, who knows. Mm. Um, and Not going to dab off, for example, is an example of that. Exactly, exactly. I think that is one, one example, perhaps, of many. Um, so we'll have to scrutinise the detail. I think there's a big difference between rhetoric and detail mm. I think you know in our manifesto and certainly in every manifesto in the in elections since I've been a Lib Dem member our um, statement that we are an internationalist party has been backed up with um, you know policies around working with our EU partners working through the UN working through the World Trade Organization working with NATO um, and I think what we see is very worrying in terms of uh, the conservative uh, manifesto which is actually you know uh, perhaps closing down international yeah. development altogether mm. um, or you merging know, it into the FCO merging it into the FCO changing the focus of international development so it's more on um, you know, supporting our own business goals mm. rather than mm. helping sort of the poorest around the world and of course this threat to our constitutional parliamentary democracy you know the threat to reform the relationship between parliament and and the courts there's a lot for us to scrutinize have you spoken to joe swinton since last week i have how is she do you know what? Um, jo is an incredibly strong person. She's got a... a resilient, isn't she? I she's mean. incredibly resilient. She really is. Immediately after the result last Thursday, she said she went out and bought a Christmas tree with her boys, which I thought was a loving, Aww. lovely thing to do. I've, I've encouraged all the candidates who haven't been successful to surround themselves with nourishing things and people and, and good things at this time of year. And uh, I saw her just the other evening where she made a speech to a, a small number of uh, party supporters and it was brilliant not only was she sort of brave in actually coming along and doing it but she made the point that you know our values haven't changed nope. um, and that she had uh, no regrets in giving the country the last opportunity to try and stop Brexit altogether. What's the plan now? There's rumours of her returning to the House of Lords as a peer I mean, Ed Davies said, I think we need to see her back in politics quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, The honest answer is I have no idea what Jo's thinking about doing. Um, She's been here before. She lost her seat before and then won it back. Mm. Um, I have no idea whether she wants to stand again to become an MP, whether she's interested in the Lords, whether she'll set up her own thing or join another Mm. organisation. I simply have no idea at this stage and I would be surprised if she knew herself, to be (laughs) honest. (laughs) Well, what's your New Year's resolution? Will it be to stop listening to the Today programme like uh, Dominic Cummings and Michael Gove? (laughs) Will you carry on? Absolutely not. I'm not, not boycotting any, uh, any national press whatsoever. The New Year's resolution is to make sure I get my surgery set up regularly in St Albans. That's the most important thing. Um, and uh, I'll be watching very carefully to see what announcements the government makes on business rates because, you know, that's a huge problem in St Albans. We've got a number of pubs and independent businesses that are incredibly worried about whether they'll survive in the new year because of the huge increases in business rates we've had over the last three years. For the last three years, it feels like we've been banging our heads against the wall um, and that the government hasn't been listening. So I will be listening very carefully to the Queen's speech uh, this morning to see what announcements are made and to see uh, devil's always in the detail. So I'll be looking at the details to see how it's going to affect businesses in St Albans. Well, Daisy Gibb, I must let you get on to the Queen's speech. Thank you for coming to Chopper's Brexit podcast. Thank happy, you. Happy Christmas. And to you. Now, my final guest is a lever who over the past two or three years has frequently come on this podcast concerned about Brexit. Well, finally... He can relax, maybe, over a glass of festive tonic. David Jones played a key role in the Welsh Vote Leave campaign and is a former Welsh Secretary and a former Brexit Minister. 
Yeah, you weren't going to stand, were you, until September, David? You're going to retire. Oh, uh, that's right. But I, I instantly regretted the decision, and I'm glad to say my association wanted me to continue. So Five we, more years here of here Jones in Parliament. Well, yes, if Parliament can bear it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Now, David Jones, it got a bit dicey last year about Brexit, but we're talking on the morning of the Queen's speech, and you can relax because the Queen's speech, no doubt, will set out plans for Brexit by the end of January. Yeah, I think that that's right. I think that Boris Johnson has made it clear he's going to keep faith with the public. Uh, th- there was some concern voiced that he might not. But I think that I and other members of the ERG and so on are, are very, very pleased that he's been so robust about it. Mm. And what, what a relief. I mean, th- it seemed to me that the only solution to the Brexit result in 2016 was to deliver Brexit. All other options would create loads more uncertainty, either negotiating a deal, a referendum again... If the Remain side won that, how do you ref- how does that even reflect on 2016? Because you can't have that one again. It would never end. Well, that's right. And, and you know, we just had an election and Brexit was certainly the, the, the principal issue. And everybody said exactly that. We voted for Brexit back in 2016. We're astonished that we haven't had it delivered so far. We want it done. Mm. Uh, and that's why the slogan, get Brexit done, was so clever, because it actually chimed with what mm. people were saying. Did it play well in, in your North Wales seat? Oh, hugely. <laughs> in fact, right across North Wales. Of course, before the election, we only had two seats. We've now got seven of the mm. nine seats in North now, why Wales. Why is that? There's not a fishing vote in there, is there? There's no fisheries there. In Scotland, of course, that's what drove the vote for Brexit. No, 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 no there isn't. I think that there are various reasons. One, of course, is that it was a pro-Brexit area that the, the, the region voted to leave. There's also a great deal of concern about the performance of the Labour Party in the Welsh Assembly. You know, we've got a, a local hospital board that's been in special measures for four and a half years. We need transport upgrades. We that need, devolves, of course, to the Welsh Government. That's all devolved to the Welsh Assembly Government, which, of course, has been Labour controlled for the last 20 years. And I think people are, are fed up with the Labour Party. And there's a chance now to think about the opportunity of Brexit, do you think, in the sense that the idea of Brexit was in a crouch for the past year under threat to a lot of people because if Labour had voted with that deal that Theresa May offered up, it would have been a lot softer, wouldn't it? Well, what we've had is three and a half years of uncertainty and, and that has now been brought to an end. So, yes, there, there is going to be an opportunity uh, and, and it's, it's very obvious that mm. business is pleased that the uncertainty is out of the way. We can now move on, talk about free trade agreements right across the world. It, it, I think it's an exciting time. And can it be done on time? I mean, can we even leave by the end of 2020? I know it would be in the Queen's speech that we are legally leaving, but surely no deal must be a threat to make that happen. Happen. I don't think that there is any threat of no deal. I think if the European Union is sensible, it will recognise that the British public have voted to leave the, the European Union. And uh, given that we're already in perfect alignment with the EU in terms of regulations and so on, there's no reason why we can't actually uh, do a, a good free trade agreement by the end of the year. Yes, the point of alignment is lost by a lot of people, isn't it? People talk about Canada taking seven years to deal with mm. the EU, but that, then you have differing regulations right down to the most basic level right. with Britain in the EU, we are the same. So essentially, it, the only debate is divergence. That, that's exactly right. And it's far easier to negotiate the areas in which we diverge than those in which we have to align. Mm. Uh, and as you say, that, that's not a problem. Now, you're tipped to be Welsh Secretary in some newspapers at the weekend when Simon Hart got the job in the end. Did you turn it down or were you relaxed uh, no, about no, it? No, I, I wasn't offered it. And quite frankly, uh, it's a question of having done it anyway. I think that it's a question, it would be back to the future. Yes. Uh, the, the, <laughs> don't, the, the, don't put yourself down. <laughs> Um, no, there are, you're there, very are there are other things that I wanted to do, and yes. uh, and I, I can do it f- from the back benches, and I, I'm looking forward to that. You've joined the executive of the European Research Group of Tory MPs. Uh, yeah, I, I was there before the election, as a yes. matter of fact, and that yes. is an important role. How many members do you have now? Quite a few. There were 35 pictures on the photograph this week. If it's only 35, then the ERG's influence won't be much this this Parliament because Boris Johnson's got a majority of 80, so he can do what he likes. Well, A, uh, we have got more members than that. How many more? I, I don't know precisely how many, but <laughs> we, ser- we, we certainly have more than that. But secondly, quite honestly, the ERG is delighted with everything it's hearing from Boris Johnson at the moment, and we want to do what we can to support the but Prime Minister. There's a theory, isn't there, that a bigger majority for Boris Johnson means a softer Brexit. He just doesn't need to keep the ERG happy or the D who are not happy, but in terms of dealing, you know, you don't have to sort of pander to the Eurosceptic wing, as critics would say. Well, 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 remember that Boris Johnson was one of the leaders of the Vote Leave campaign, so he's a Brexiteer through and through, and the Queen's speech that we'll be seeing later on today, I've no doubt, will make it absolutely clear that he wants a clean Brexit as quickly as possible. In your wildest dreams, could you imagine a more relaxed Christmas? Even as recently as October, because it felt, in this bunker in the Red Lion pub, you know, often would emerge blinking into the light and something else happened 
and someone had resigned, the government was teetering. It felt like some kind of battle has been fought above us the last past year. Well, look, look it, it, it certainly is a new world, and I think everybody uh, on my side of the argument is, is extremely pleased. I think, actually, the country is very pleased, too. The country wanted to see the end of Brexit, and now it sees the opportunity to leave. the three years of, of nothing happening to get to a point where the country agrees, in, in a sense, agree, by, by which I mean a majority of parties won power, on a way forward on Brexit. No, we didn't need it. Uh, we, we, it went on far too long. I think everybody recognised that. And, of course, part of the reason it went on for so long was that so many of my colleagues in the last parliament did their best to frustrate mm-hmm. it. And, of course, a lot of those are no longer with us. Have you lost friends there uh, not amongst many. that group? Not many, no. <laughs> if you like, let's say Philip Hammond is a, is a dry fiscal Tory who would agree with you on virtually every policy that you've got, David Jones, apart from Brexit. That's the one thing that, that you diverged with him yeah, on. But, 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 but Brexit was the overarching issue. I mean, some of them, yes, I remained on very good terms with. I won't tell you who, but by and large, I think that many of them were quite disruptive and really, frankly, behaved very badly. Should they be given peerages? Normally, former chancellors are given uh, roles in the Lords if they want them. Well, that's a matter for the Prime Minister. And, and I wouldn't want to venture into that, frankly. But would you give them a fewer Prime Minister? Uh, I, I frankly think that the House of Lords needs fewer members rather than more. Or perhaps more of the right ones, you might argue. Well, I think that that's probably right. I think that the number of Lib Dems is disproportionate <laughs> to their actual political influence. What's your New Year's resolution, David Jones? Is it like Michael Gove to stop listening to the Today programme and listen more to Chopper's Brexit podcast? I, uh, well, well, I don't have to make the last resolution because I'll already listen to it avidly. <laughs> uh, but no, I, I don't make New Year's resolutions because I'm sure to break them. I, I just will carry on as I am. Well, David Jones, you've been a great friend of the podcast over the past three years and do keep coming on. And happy Christmas. Happy Christmas, Nadolly Klawenichi. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now, somebody else is ready to take my table at the Red Lion pub, so that's your lot for today. Well, what a year it's been. Quite extraordinary. The year unlike I've ever experienced ever in my time covering politics for Telegraph. It started off with a very real existential threat to Brexit, and really that carried on until, really, last week, when finally... The electoral wave crashed on the beach, smashing away these sandcastles of obstinacy and remain, getting in a way of delivering on the vote of 2016. And I feel quite a relief as a reporter to see some way forward. It's been so difficult to cover it, never going forward, always going back, then forward a bit, never quite clear where it ends. And that's taken its toll on a lot of people, MPs, staff in the Commons and journalists. So I think whatever you think about Brexit, there's a big degree of relief that finally there's a way forward. But of course, the next year we'll work out how that future will shape up. And do keep listening to this podcast because we'll be there every step of the way. This podcast couldn't be possible without my great team around it, Theo Leludis and Elliot Lampett, who do the sound and produce it. But it doesn't always go to plan. Hello, I'm... <clears throat> <laughs> we'll keep that there. <laughs> Hello. Hello, I'm Christopher Hope, the Telegraph's chief political... Oh, Chris, yep. Hi, Chris. What do you say coming up on Chopper's Brexit podcast? Yes, of course. What do I say? Coming up on Chopper's Brexit podcast. I, I, I just say that. Yes. Coming up on Chopper's... Bo- no, I'm not going to get it. Bo- 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 podcast. <laughs> it's like, know. One, you know, seashells on the seashore. Yeah. When we... Uh, <laughs> when we and we'll put in um, all links to your your findings in our show notes for listeners to look, in, look at them. Thank you. Should we do that one? Sorry, Sorry I'm so tired, Johnny. No, no, no. Were you up till two in the morning? Yeah, a bit. Um, it's just wearing us all down, isn't it? <laughs> you are describing an individual there who is an impassionate person and, and is a bit scatological. I mean, it does sound like the Boris Johnson we know, doesn't it? I, I mean, not about he's... scatological. I don't know if um, But he's impulsive. Impulsive, he's, he's, yeah, that's a fellow word. He's... <laughs> Um, Should we take that again? Let's take that again. You know what scatological is? No, I don't actually. It means, it means, it means his poo. interest in poo. Oh my God. I, think I thought it meant he was random. Scatty. Scatty. I think, I think we Let's should keep that. <laughs> no, no, and let me lose that straight away. Would you mind saying coming up on Chopper's Brexit podcast? You bet. Lovely. Yeah. Coming's up. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Dominic Cummings up. <laughs> Cummings up. <laughs> Dominic Cummings up. No. Okay. Fine. And what are the odds on leaving on March 31st? March 29th. Let's do that question, And what are the odds on leaving on March 29th? I think it'd be very odd not to leave on March 29th. And the odds? Yes, I was saying it'd be very odd not to. <laughs> <laughs>
there we go thank you to my guests this week Jeffrey Cox Daisy Cooper and of course David Jones but most importantly of all thank you to you for listening happy Christmas happy new year and happy Brexit year And if you're thinking about what to get me for Christmas, I would love a five-star rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps others find this show. Thank you to Jonah the Whale, Burn the Toast, and Kino Magic, who this week gave us that rating. It's much appreciated by everybody on this team. If you want to get in touch, as you know, we're on Twitter, at Brexit Broadcast, or email us, choppersbrexitpodcast, at telegraph.co.uk. And don't forget, you can get 30 days free access to Telegraph online by going to telegraph.co.uk forward slash chopper. And I'll stick that link in the show notes to this episode, as well as a couple of articles I think you shouldn't miss, such as Tim Roby's review of Cats, the first ever zero rating Tim's ever given for any film since 2010. And finally, finally, always buy a copy of the Daily Telegraph. You won't regret it. Until next time, until next year, cheerio! Cheerio!